uh, will come in. Um, but in any event, it is a, it is a great pleasure to, uh, uh, to be able to introduce Bob Crandall to give the, uh, the opening talk on this uh, first full day of the conference. I've known Bob uh, literally since I first came to Washington, which is now, now a long time. <laughs> um, Bob, uh, I think, is one of the, one of the most productive uh, economists working in the uh, economics of regulation and industrial organization. He's had he's made many contributions to many areas of of the economics of regulation and industrial organizations. But I do think that the contributions that he's made uh, to uh, in the telecommunic telecommunications area stand out, and it's hard to uh, hard to. Uh, think of anybody else who has, uh, who has contributed as much over the years. Bob has spent uh, um, much of his career uh, as a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and uh, we were delighted when he agreed earlier this year to uh, also become affiliated with uh, TPI. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Bob. Well, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, nice to be able to talk to the opening uh, session of, of this conference. Um, and also nice that Tom could, could have joined us all day yesterday at the reception for two hours standing there after his accident. And then last night, I don't know if his staff knows that, uh, uh, he walked back from dinner um, despite uh, the other options that are available to him. But um, this morning in talking to Tom, I just want to reassure his staff, he hints that he's probably going to forego his planned uh, bike ride up to Independence Pass on Wednesday. So, uh, isn't that right, Tom? Um, yeah, I, my talk uh, today, is uh, it, uh, what Tom wanted me to talk about, is broadband policy. Some of this, uh, given uh, the discussions today, is sort of going to be old hat. Uh, we're moving past a lot of these things. Um, but I guess I'd rather talk about that than uh, uh, Cliff Winston, my l latest book, which argues we need more lawyers. That would probably be a little more controversial here. Um, let me just start by uh, pointing out that in some areas, government policy seems to be succeeding. Um, these are two cars that are produced in the same plant, uh, t what, uh, 20 years apart. Uh, the old uh, uh, Toyota GM uh, uh, Prism of 1994, and now in the same Fremont plant, since that no longer exists, uh, a much better vehicle, uh, an electric vehicle designed to uh, reduce carbon emissions, uh, uh, the uh, 2013 Tesla. And Tesla, of course, has been a darling of, uh, of Wall Street lately. And the uh, rather considerable government subsidies that go into this company in various forms uh, seem to have, have been a success. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Question is, should we have an equally uh, aggressive policy about broadband. Well, to some extent, we settled this with the National Broadband Plan some time ago, and the fervor for this has declined. But there's still this talk about our lagging in broadband penetration, whatever the numbers are. Often the numbers are rather misleading because uh, of the, uh, the way in which broadband is defined, whether it includes wireless, whether it's per 100 people or per household, et cetera. Um, the more relevant uh, discussion perhaps around here would be um, that the market is, is moving too slowly in delivering higher and higher speeds or super fast broadband. Um, the digital divide issue, of course, is still with us and to some extent was addressed by the uh, uh, stimulus plan uh, with the um, uh, NTIA and RUS uh, 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 subsidies for broadband uh, back um, uh, two or three years ago. Um, and uh, then finally, there's a more, a more current issue of market concentration in broadband combined with vertical integration into programming, largely motivated by the uh, Comcast acquisition of the, of it, the remaining ownership of NBC Universal. Uh, what I'll try to do is just talk a bit about some of the data, some data that might bear on some of these issues. Uh, by comparing broadband penetration uh, with other OECD countries, uh, by looking at the effect of past broadband regulation on capital expenditures, uh, by reviewing uh, some of the empirical evidence on the FCC's universal service policy, since we're now continuing universal service, but uh, in the broadband uh, domain. 
Um, and then uh, some preliminary evidence, albeit really preliminary evidence, on the effects of stimulus spending. And talking to Scott Walson and others here, they are trying to mount a much bigger effort to look at how successful that spending has been in expanding either access or take up of broadband. And then some evidence that you might not have seen on, on uh, US media concentration. Um, just a brief retrospective, most of us obviously know this stuff. Uh, we were once aggressive uh, regulators at the wholesale level uh, for uh, broadband, imposing even line sharing and unbundling of the local copper loop. Um, we certainly backed off from that, uh, and, and particularly in for new fiber insulation, and then finally, of course, for all broadband, because we'd never regulated wholesale access to cable networks. Um, Cable and wireless broadband direct, direct, uh, developed very ra uh, rapidly, unconstrained by regulation. I can remember the arguments I used to have with the Europeans about why we were so far behind in, in uh, wireless because we didn't have calling party pays. I think uh, that's been resolved um, in the other direction. Uh, and then uh, elsewhere, in, in, except for Canada, almost every other country has a more aggressive uh, wholesale network unbundling regime, and in some countries, it is, uh, they've moved past that because they've grown frustrated with it and gone directly into government subsidies or government building of a broadband network, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so what I want to do is just go over just briefly some evidence of how we're doing on penetration, speed, network coverage, wireless, cap capex, and then media concentration. To start, first of all, uh, with the OECD data, um, and uh, we don't need to debate today uh, whether this is a, uh, the best measure of, of broadband, but it's the most comprehensive across major industrial countries. And what you see here is what has happened over a period of uh, about a decade uh, to broadband penetration in the overall OECD, uh, in the EU 15, uh, which are most comparable to the United States, I suppose, and the US itself. And there you can see that they're all converging to about the same level of penetration, where this is penetration measured per household, not per hundred uh, uh, people. So essentially, this argument is going away as we all converge to about the same degree of broadband penetration. Um, as for speed, we've had sub substantial increases in average uh, down, uh, download speed uh, of, of broadband over the years. I was even surprised. I now live at the foot of Mount Washington in New Hampshire in a little town, about 600 people, and I had to have a Com uh, not Comcast, uh, Time Warner guy come over to do some repair. And though I use my broadband service every day, I don't check its speed anymore. Uh, and uh, I said, well, what am I getting? He said, well, you're, you're probably getting 15 to 20, but you could get 50 if you wanted. Um, and um, because I don't download lots of videos, uh, I haven't uh, chosen that option. So even up there in, the, in the northern New England, uh, in a uh, sparsely uh, populated area, uh, I can get 15 uh, megs. And I don't know what I could get from Fairpoint, but that might be uh, another issue because of how well Fairpoint is doing. Um, then uh, to look at how we're doing compared with other countries, with o overall o OECD in terms of quality or download speed, clearly we're, we're just a little bit better than the average for OECD. Japan and Korea are way ahead of us uh, because they have much more uh, fiber uh, than we do. Uh, but uh, still, we, we aren't lagging the OECD. We're about at the OECD average. And uh, as you can see there, for the, the, that, uh, the quality for uh, you know, uh, uh, Flutter and all, all those other things, uh, the R factor, uh, we're doing relatively well. So we're not lagging either in penetration or in speed. Um, now, the, the other issue is, do we have universal coverage? And uh, if you look at the latest, uh, it's now getting a little old, about a year old, the latest broadband progress report from the FCC, though it talks in rather pessimistic terms, uh, these are the facts that it reflects, that 19 million Americans uh, lack access to fixed broadband at speeds of four megabits up and one megabit down, and 14.5 million of these are in rural areas. But when you include wireless, there's only 5.1 million who, who do not have access uh, to at least uh, 768 kilobits per second and 5.5 million uh, who lack uh, access to at least 4 megabits per second. So in a country of 300 and what is that, are we 15, 20 million now? Um, five and a half million not having access uh, is hardly a, an enormous serious issue, uh, one would think. 
Um, as for wireless, um, our broadband penetration, wireless broadband penetration, which I've sort of blocked out the U.S. there in black so you can see it, um, it, it is very good. Uh, there are a few who are ahead of us again, and be Korea, Japan, um, Australia. But uh, for the most part, we are, are substantially ahead of, uh, of broadband penetration per 100 in inhabitants for wireless uh, and substantially ahead of most European countries, again, using OECD data. And um, our speed uh, seems to be even farther ahead. Now, this is all North America, so it would include Canada, uh, uh, even farther ahead of the rest of the OECD uh, than, uh, than the uh, previous thing showed about uh, penetration. So speed, wireless speed, given the, the, uh, the deployment of LTE 4G, uh, has really uh, accelerated substantially in the United States over recent years. Now, the second issue I'm addressing here is what is the effect of regulation? I briefly went over the fact that there have been much more wholesale regulation outside uh, the United States than in the United States. Uh, Canada is similar to us. They nominally have more wholesale regulation for broadband, but very little take up of it, just as Japan has formally a, an unbundling requirement for fiber, but there's no take up of it because it can't be implemented given the GPON network of NTT. But what this shows are the blue bars is the capex per dollar of revenue for entire ILEC companies. I used to try to do this for just the fixed wire part, but it becomes impossible over time uh, because of the way companies report and they don't break it down between fixed wire and wireless. And even if they do, chances are uh, it's difficult to, uh, to break down the capex uh, for the middle miles sort of stuff between wireless and fixed wire. So this is for the entire operations of, uh, of uh, ILEX. Uh, and for the EU and the US, again, the EU 15, but not all 15 of them, I think there's like 12 or 13 in here, some of them uh, it's impossible to get the data for. And what you see here is over a long period of time, a decade here, the CapEx per dollar of revenue uh, is uh, substantially higher in the US than it has been in Europe. And for this reason, Europe is now concerned about the fact that it is falling behind in the deployment of new next generation networks, fiber, and is concerned about what they can do about it, though they still haven't resolved what to do about fiber unbundling. Now, if you look at uh, the, uh, the capital expenditures by uh, <clears throat> uh, platform uh, in the US, the uh, wireless numbers here, this is a cumulative capital expenditure over the last 10 years uh, through, through 2012, the wireless numbers come from uh, the Bureau of the, uh, Bureau of the Census. Uh, the ILEC numbers come from the company reports of the major ILECs. And uh, the cable code numbers come from NCTA. And what you see here is uh, a substantial amount of spending by the uh, uh, ILECs and non-ILECs and wireless and ILEX on wireline. And the, the uh, cable companies able to, to deploy DOCSIS 3 and get substantial advantage over most uh, uh, ILEX, particularly those that don't have any fiber, uh, at much lower capital cost than the fixed wire companies. The cable companies have been, it's much easier to convert the uh, hybrid fiber coax networks uh, to uh, uh, high speed data services with video than it has been for the ILEX to do the same and get video services. So we have, a, we've had a lot of competition with a, essentially the ILEX trying to catch up. Now, given these, given these uh, uh, results, what's, what's left uh, to be done? Well. Could we promote greater uh, coverage through universal service? Could we somehow promote higher speed networks, uh, reduce market concentration? How would we do that? Or finally, I'll get into what about uh, the uh, vertical integration into content. Um, the continuation of the FCC's universal service program, the high cost program in particular, uh, is, is problematic, and just extending it from traditional voice services into broadband services doesn't solve the fundamental problem, uh, which is that there's very little evidence that any of this has increased uh, subscriptions, reduced prices, or had any beneficial effects, and despite an expenditure of four to five billion dollars a year on high-cost universal service. Now, there have been various studies of the effect 
of, uh, of the other aspect of, uh, of uh, universal service policy, which is lifeline link up, but not nearly as many studies of uh, high cost service. I did a study of the state of Iowa after Verizon sold it's, uh, I think it was, yeah, the GTE properties in Iowa to Iowa Telecom, who was not getting any subsidies, uh, high cost subsidies, and they were able to compete very nicely uh, without these high cost subsidies, but, uh, uh, and, and there was very little evidence that those who had the high cost subsidies uh, were, were, were doing any better in terms of uh, prices or penetration than the unsubsidized, similarly placed rural uh, companies in Iowa. But when you look at the lifetime link-up, which have been studied much more, much more intensively, there are a series of studies by uh, uh, Garbus and Thompson, the most recent of which suggests it costs about 8000 to 22000 uh, per household per additional uh, 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 connection to the fixed wire network. Uh, whereas um, the, a more recent study by Mike Reardon, Nackerberg and all, et al., find lower costs of $519 per year to, to uh, induce low-income households sub subscribe. But that still is a huge price to pay, if accurate, for uh, a service which, uh, which may be much cheaper uh, to deliver. I mean, the, the, there's just a huge amount of inframarginal subsidies going on here. Um, more recently, Jeff Eisenach and, uh, and Caves find that uh, three large grants of, under the RUS stimulus program cost between, now this is not per subscriber, but per, uh, per uh, uh, incremental household past, I believe, uh, $14,000 to $346,000 per incremental household. Now, the problem with any such study as that is they're only looking at three large grants. There's a huge problem of, of potential selectivity bias there. So I'm, I suspect we're going to get a lot more analysis of these uh, NTIA or U.S. subsidy programs as time passes. But uh, the, the, uh, we know why there, there are problems in universal service policy. First of all, historically, as uh, people like myself or Jerry Hausman, more importantly, have pointed out, uh, taxing price-sensitive services in order to subsidize less price-sensitive services is enormously inefficient. And secondly, there's an awful lot of inframarginal subsidy going on here. That is, it, it ends up being subsidies to people who would have subscribed anyway. Uh, I looked into the RUS uh, uh, NTIA stimulus spending across states. Now, clearly, uh, look, and analyzing changes in broadband penetration per state is, awfully, is an awfully crude measure. You'd like it much more narrowly focused, since the, the grants themselves are much more narrowly focused. But uh, thus far, I've been unable to get data to do that. And I can find virtually no effect. On, on penetration, certainly no statistically significant effect. Now, I wouldn't take this uh, all that seriously. First of all, it's early, and secondly, the, uh, the data are awfully crude. That is, they are statewide rather than more narrowly focused. Um, but even, even if uh, we are making some progress, and even if some of these programs uh, have reduced the problem, uh, the digital divide problem, have given us greater coverage for, uh, for, for broadband across rural areas. Coverage is really not uh, the, uh, the essential problem. Uh, if we're going to have extremely high speed services, you know, demand is one of the, one of the large problems. If it, the reason why uh, more, more companies are, may not be uh, deploying high speed fiber may be that they don't see the, enough demand for super fast take up. I tried to get numbers out of Hal Varian on how they're doing in Kansas City, but he wouldn't tell me. So, uh, um, <laughs> uh, so going back to the FCC broadband report, uh, they, they uh, pointed out that 55% uh, uh, you know, of homes had access to uh, 50 megabits per second in June uh, 2011. NCTA suggests that at least 85%, it may be higher than that now because that's a historical number on the NCTA website, have 85%, uh, they're 85% now have access to DOCSIS 3. Um, despite this availability, uh, only 28% of homes purchase uh, broadband uh, with at least six uh, meg megs of download speed in June uh, 2011. So that's most households don't seem to want to pay um, uh, ver as whatever the premium is for extremely high speed service. Um, now, NTT and, and uh, KT in Korea 
um, have extremely high speed services because they have much more ubiquitous fiber than anyone in the United States, uh, even Verizon has, I believe. Uh, so it's particularly uh, uh, NTT, because the numbers are public there. But uh, what they find is a few households want to go up to 100 megabits per second that they can offer, or even more uh, that they can offer. Um, and here's a rather striking uh, 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 chart. This is the uh, market value of uh, uh, incumbent telecom companies uh, in Canada, in the United States, Verizon and AT&T on the right, and then NTT and, and KT in the middle. Canada is TELUS and BC, Bell Canada Enterprises. Uh, what you see here is the ratio of market value to the cumulative capital expenditure, 10-year capital expenditures by these companies in the telecom networks. The ones that have spent the most on fiber up there are probably NTT and Korea Telecom. Verizon's up there, uh, but they haven't been punished by the market as much as NTT and, K and KT have been. Now, admittedly, these are market values for the entire corporation. So they include wireless and they include whatever else they do. Uh, so some of the difference could be attributed to differential wireless performance. But what is particularly stunning is how badly NTT and KT are performing. And I, can, and I can remember back when NTT was rolling out its fiber, its CEO had come to the United States, and a large part of the reason for coming here was to try to persuade Wall Street that what he was doing made sense. And he seemed to uh, express some doubts himself as he went ahead with this program. So, so far the market has not uh, rewarded uh, the, the two of the leaders in the deployment of fiber, and I would argue that could well be because of the, the lack of take up of sufficient, high, extremely high speed fiber at large premiums to make it worthwhile to roll out that fiber yet. Now, I'm not saying that won't be the case in the future. Uh, as for market concentration, I don't know what we can do. We have, I mean, clearly we've had some battles over increasing market concentration in wireless. Uh, and I'm, um, uh, I don't know where that's going, but uh, we are not going to get uh, new fixed wire entrance other than uh, a little bit of uh, Google Fiber in Kansas City, what, uh, Provo and uh, Austin and a few other cities. Uh, so it's hard to imagine how we would increase entry into fixed services. We surely know that, uh, that the uh, use of, of, of wholesale unbundling policies, which could be aggressive enough to induce entry, uh, are, going to, are not going to work because of their adverse effects on capital investment. And what you clearly need if you're worried about more competition and super fast broadband is a lot of capital investment. Uh, but now the major uh, uh, push seems to come from uh, uh, vertical integration and media control. And um, we all know about Tim Wu and Susan Crawford's laments over how uh, things have evolved in broadband space, and particularly Susan Crawford worrying about the Comcast NBC Universal merger. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, nationwide, neither distribution nor content is heavily concentrated. What is surprising to me is how steady the media industries have been despite all the changes in technology for delivering their, the potential changes of delivering their, their content. Uh, here are two charts, and I'm getting running out of time here, uh, showing you for the uh, 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 major distributors, uh, multi-channel distributors, uh, including, of course, Verizon and AT&T, uh, the concentration, which is not particularly high on a national level uh, for subscribers, it's a little higher for market caps on the right-hand side. Uh, but here's, here's, I think, the, um, one of the more interesting aspects. Uh, the, this is the size distribution of the large media com companies. Uh, on the left is Disney, then, then News Corp. I think that's News Corp before the split up, so that includes the Wall Street Journal. Um, Time Warner, uh, and then right there in the middle, uh, the Comcast uh, NBC Universal. That is just uh, the market cap of NBC Universal at the time of, uh, that uh, Comcast bought the remaining share. Um, and uh, then the, uh, an, an attempt to up, update that. Uh, the rest of them are actual market caps of the entire companies going all the way down to, I can't even see them now. Liberty Media. Liberty Media, okay. Liberty Media, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't say it. But um, is, do I have uh, the, 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 one, two, three, four, five. Is Sony in there? I'm, I'm looking yeah, for Sony. Yeah, okay, Sony's in there. Uh, the reason why that's important is it's not clear whether in the next set of d data Sony's an American company or not at this point because it's, a, it's, a Sony, it's Sony's 
uh, media companies, which are largely American. And here you see a, a relationship of the top eight. I did not include Sony because I didn't know whether they were they are included in the U.S. census data on total revenues of media companies. The red bars are the total revenues reported by the Census Bureau of media companies. Uh, and down below are the, uh, are the media revenues of the eight largest, that is all but Sony on the previous chart. And there you can see there has been some increase in concentration, but still you've got eight companies uh, still not accounting for more than about 80% of, of total media sales. Now you can draw your own conclusions about whether that's scary or not, but it, it strikes me it's been a relatively stable relationship over time despite all the changes and the concerns of, of Susan Crawford and Tim Wu about how the big media companies are going to take over the world. Um, and then finally, uh, just something about you know past attempts to control vertical integration, and I raised the AOL Time Warner example, or the old FCC uh, financial interest syndication rules. I could even take on uh, a lot of people in this audience, probably about AT&T, uh, the antitrust suit, uh, the, the 84 breakup, but let's not get into that now. Uh, uh, but outside the U.S., uh, what is going on is it seems that there is a move towards frustration over the failure of the network unbundling policies to work and to create the incentives to invest in fiber. As, as I point out, pointed out earlier, the EU still hasn't resolved this issue. And you're talking to some people here, they, uh, we can't get a, they don't seem to uh, suggest a conclusion. And they're even talking about spending $8 billion. That's before they spent it on Greece and Portugal and Ireland and whatever. So I'm not sure that they're going to do that now. But the Australians and the New Zealands, New Zealand governments, have actually moved to essentially develop national networks funded by government monies. And what do I have? Here. Oh, the number for Australia I have is 26 uh, billion. Uh, in talking to Joshua Gans, who apparently worked on it, uh, he tells me it might be up to 60 billion, and it doesn't cover the entire country. Uh, 7.9 million households is not quite the entire country. Divide, if 60 is the right number now, by 7.9, that is an extremely high cost to wire out uh, super fast broadband. Uh, lots of luck in getting that investment back. Uh, and New Zealand's followed a similar path, but they uh, are spending far less. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, okay, well, the conclusion then is that government interventions to improve broadband are not likely to see the traditional ones because the, uh, the uh, drive for regulation is political. It's going to have to subsidize one group at the expense of another. Uh, given what we've done through universal service policy over the years, those have been very costly, policy, costly policies. They're often uh, uh, not well targeted at incremental subscriptions. Uh, whole, uh, mandating wholesale access through regulation has not worked well elsewhere, and we've essentially abandoned it. And limiting vertical integration into content, at least from past history, seems to be uh, ineffective and maybe even counterproductive. Now let me come back to uh, the success with Tesla. Here's the results of a CBO study on what it costs per ton of carbon abated from electric vehicles on the, uh, the two bars on the left. The one that goes up to 4,500, that's an electric vehicle uh, which is recharged from electricity come for, coming from a coal-fired plant. And the, uh, the red one with a much lower bar, uh, which looks like about $300 per ton, is what it costs if it comes from a natural gas-fired plant, as I recall. But then the bars for wind and geothermal, the subsidies there, they don't even show because they're $12 and $8 respectively is what the cost so far of the subsidies to wind and geothermal have been. So Tesla may be a great success on Wall Street, but it has a lot to do with the enormous costs we're paying uh, in terms of government subsidies. And this, by the way, are the federal government subsidies. They don't include the ZEV subsidies at the state level. Tesla sells rights to its ZV, uh, credits to its Z, uh, ZEV production to the other motion, uh, motor vehicle producers, I think most recently at around fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars. So this is a, a relative success, and uh, I said it the wrong way. And right next door, physically, uh, the next plant over from the Tesla plant is the Solyndra plant, and uh, obviously that's an even uh, greater failure. So. If we measure our success in broadband policy against these, uh, we, we ought to have uh, an easy time of it. Thank you very much. Hi, Laura Martin, Needham. Um, 
as uh, speeds, as more and more video comes over the broadband plant, um, I do think we are seeing more adoption of faster speeds. How do you feel uh, about gating or usage-based pricing on the broadband plant? Time Warner introduced it, Time Warner Cable, and the government was very negative, but they've since installed usage pricing on the downside, that if you don't use that much broadband, you can get cheaper prices. And it feels like for video to be delivered over high-speed modems, we are going to need usage-based pricing in the end to continue yeah. to get investment. Well, I, I certainly agree. I, I should have said at the beginning, the two topics I obviously don't address here are the net neutrality issue, and that's a subset of that, and also all the spectrum issues, which you're going to have lots of discussion about, and I know much less than uh, Evan Quarrell and his friends uh, know about that issue. Uh, but as for uh, the, the differential pricing for speed, I mean, obviously that makes uh, economic sense. The concern, I suppose, is that it can be used discriminately, uh, uh, discriminatorily against uh, uh, content that competes with a distributor's own content, and that's, it seems to me, the only issue. Other than that, you certainly would like uh, to have uh, uh, variable pricing. Thank you. Brian Vick with Deutsche Telekom. Um, you described very interestingly the, uh, the effect of uh, ex anti regulation in Europe. So what do you say ex anti regulation in Europe serves as an incentive for the entry of uh, non-European companies to the European market, or would it be a disincentive? Mm -hmm. Are you from KPN? No, I'm from Deutsche Telekom. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, um, well, I, just, I, I haven't really thought much about that. I mean, obviously, Carlos Slim has, uh, and, uh, and he seems to be entering. Um, but um, I'm not sure that the foreign entry, especially Slim's entry, is based upon what's going on in regulation of the fixed wire network. I think he's more interested in the wireless side, um, but I could be wrong about that. I've not had any conversations with him and not seen any uh, uh, analyses of that. But I would think that it's in the wireless side where the action is now, though I can't be, I can't be sure. Just for the facts, wireless is regulated as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Well, obviously, and then roaming, roaming and termination charges are huge, huge issues, uh, issues we, we simply don't have in this country. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Harold Fell with Public Knowledge. Uh, yeah. Just a, a couple of quick points, um, if I may. First, with regard to Europe, I do have to say that there is a tendency for either side which invokes Europe um, to want to disregard uh, the balancing. There were certain benefits that came from uh, Europe's uh, policies, such as lower prices uh, to consumers for adoption, which, you know, speeded adoption. They had a different set of problems as a consequence, and I just point out that um, whether you agree with the European model of structural separation or disagree with it, it's important to uh, evaluate uh, the entire uh, set uh, of benefits and problems that uh, uh, emerge as a consequence of the policy. Uh, but my, uh, uh, my actual question is uh, uh, more related to the problem of universal service and local broadband, um, where uh, it does seem that uh, in the United States we are having a very lumpy uh, sort of deployment, if you will. There are places where there's a very clear business case uh, for uh, several companies to compete. Uh, there are many places uh, where uh, there is hardly a business case for one company, uh, let alone for a multitude of uh, companies. Um, isn't a, uh, um, you know, potentially, uh, isn't it a uh, better approach then to allow localities uh, to figure out how much they want to invest in this in terms of infrastructure? And I'd ask uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the question of whether localities um, should be uh, uh, prohibited uh, by law from uh, building out broadband infrastructure or uh, whether they should not be prohibited, if you have uh, an opinion on that in light of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the data. Well, I guess uh, two things. First of all, as to your first observation, the issue of whether the wholesale unbundling regimes around the world have generated uh, more rapid uh, increases in penetration 
uh, has been exhaustively studied, and the, the results are in. It doesn't. Uh, if uh, it probably, probably the best way to characterize the evidence is there's no significant effect. Uh, our most recent study in telecommunications policy could even find a slightly negative effect because it reduces the incentive of the entrant to invest. Uh, secondly, uh, on allowing municipalities, I really haven't come back to that issue. I note that uh, in our discussion last night, Hal, I can't, I can't see it in this light, but Hal Varian was telling me that the reason they're in Provo is they bought a bankrupt municipal network there. My recollection of the uh, numbers on municipal investment in broadband was that it had not been very successful, but I haven't looked at it in the last four or five years, so I'm not, um, three or four years probably, and I'm, so I'm not up to date on that. But uh, uh, if, if uh, city governments want to spend uh, uh, their own money on, uh, or spend their taxpayers' money on, uh, on broadband projects, um, perhaps we should let them. I'm sure the ILEX and the cable companies in this room have a different view. Um, but I don't know right now what the evidence is and how well they've done on that. I'm skeptical. <clears throat> Okay.